time is 6 p.m. on Monday, August 10th, 2020. This is a special meeting. Let's go ahead and have a roll call, please, Ms. Garcia. Mayor Walter. Here. Vice Mayor Anderson. Here. Councilmember Wall. Here. Councilmember Larson. Here. Councilmember Cortez. Here. Councilmember Hughes. I've not heard from Councilmember Hughes. I'll send her a text. Okay, thank you. We'll go ahead and open up the work session on the CARES Act funding. At this time, I am going to call forward Mr. Benjamin Bitter to give some background regarding the CARES funding as well as start his presentation. Thanks, Mayor, members of the council. Let me share my screen here and we'll get uh, optimized for presentation here. So what we wanted to do is, is kind of gather together all of the feedback we've had over the last two months as well as discussions that, that you all have had as council on the floor as of a, a few weeks ago, and then also provide the community with some background about Florence CARES funding, and then ultimately make a recommendation to you all for, for your discussion and then potential for future action on a, on a future council agenda. So just by way of background, and I'll try to breeze through these quickly because I know you all as council have seen this, but we also wanted to provide this to the community so that they could be aware of of what the background is in terms of the, the CARES Act. Um, the CARES Act was signed into law by President Trump in March of 2020. It's a $2.2 trillion aid package that was meant to effectively be a stimulus in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Various pots of money were distributed through the CARES Act, and we'll go into some of these in, in just a little bit, but this gives you an idea of, of the various um, pots of funding that were available through the CARES Act. So about $560 billion for individuals, large corporations, about a half trillion dollars, so $500 billion, small businesses, $377 billion, public health got about $154 billion, state and local governments, $340 billion, safety net, education and other. And so you see the various pots of money there that uh, the CARES Act funded. Just by a little bit of explanation, so it breaks it down so that we can all understand on an individual level. Uh, for individuals like regular taxpayers, uh, there was $300 billion. Those were the direct stimulus packages that we received, the, the checks of $1,200 per adult or $500 per each dependent. So hopefully everyone received that back in March or early April. Um, following that, there was also an unemployment benefits increase, which was the 600 extra dollars per week for the unemployment. That cost the federal government about 260 billion. Major industries got 208 billion, small business 300 billion. And then the payroll, or sorry, the Paycheck Protection Program was an additional $300 billion. And that's for the forgivable loan program for, for small and medium businesses as well. So for small businesses in particular, the funding options displayed here on screen included the Paycheck Protection Program, which we just talked about, as well as the Economic Injury Disaster Loan. And then they had access to new funding through the Small Business Administration's Express Bridge Loans and Debt Relief Grant Programs. And so a few different pots of, of funding for small businesses. Now, as it relates to specifically the Town of Florence and the funds that we received, the CARES Act was, a, again, the $2.2 trillion act. Part of that act created the Coronavirus Relief Fund, which was given $150 billion, and that was meant to go to cities and towns across the country. As you see, about $8 billion went to tribes, $3 billion went to U.S. territories like Puerto Rico or Guam, um, and then $139 billion was distributed to states across the country and to large communities, large <laughs> cities. So in Arizona, we received a total of $2.82 billion. And of that $2.82 billion, the five largest cities, so that's Phoenix, Mesa, Tucson, Maricopa County, and Pima County, received $965 million. The state retained $1.4 billion for their own use or for future distribution. And then the 101 other small cities, counties, and towns, so that would include anything from Florence to Gila County to 
Yavapai County to the city of Flagstaff to the city of Yuma, uh, all of those 101 entities received a total of $441 million. And all in all, that left the town of Florence receiving an allocation of about $3.1 million. So the discussion that we have is about this $3.1 million and, and how that should be uh, set aside. So the, a few of the, I guess, hiccups along the way that we've talked about previously, but just wanted to make sure that everyone in the public was also aware. The guidance from the United States Department of Treasury actually said that 45% of the funds that were allocated to the state, and again, that's $2.8 billion. So they said the 45% of that fund should be distributed to cities and towns. So under that scenario, cities and towns would have gotten one point, almost $1.3 uh, $1.3 billion. And as I mentioned earlier, we only got about $441 million. So we got 34% of what we were supposed to get under, under federal guidelines. Um, there could be future um, funding distributions from the governor, uh, from AZ CARES Fund. But what we've seen is largely a lot of those funds have gone to other entities. So they, the governor's office has decided to, to pay for public health costs or decided to, to provide an allocation to the school districts so they can provide some extra benefits for those within the school districts as well. And so um, a few nuances. And then finally, as, as again, we've mentioned before, Maricopa County and Pima County both received direct allocations from the federal government and all of the smaller cities within those counties also received allocations from the, from the state fund. And so it actually turns out that if you're a city or a town within Maricopa County or within Pima County, you have access to a, to a higher amount of, a higher level of funding than other communities do. So those are some challenges that, that we face where we didn't maybe get access to as many funds as, as some other cities and, and towns within the state of Arizona. So as mentioned that Florence got $3.1 million funds. These funds are meant to cover under the guidelines from the state, meant to cover the costs of our extra public safety response to due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the way that we received these costs, we actually had to submit documentation that justified the $3.1 million. And the documentation we had to provide was a list of our payroll expenses to date, as well as a projection for what our payroll expenses would be for public safety through December 31st of 2020. And so effectively, because we had more than $3.1 million in salary costs for our public safety, both police and fire, um, that justified the $3.1 million coming back to the town of Florence. And so that is the guidelines that we received from the state in addition to the guidelines that we have from the US Department of Treasury, uh, because this is again, federal money that is ultimately being allocated to the city and town. So, some of the concerns that we had as we've been reviewing projects, as we've talked to the League of Cities, as we've talked to the governor's office and the attorney general's office, there are these three concerns and we'll hit them a little bit more in, in the coming slides. But first of all, we may not see another allocation to local governments. We don't know if this $441 million that we've received from the state is all we're gonna see, or if the federal government is going to provide more funding or if the state is going to provide more funding. We just don't know that. We don't know if, if there's, there's more around the corner. Uh, secondly, the town's current budget that we're in right now, the fiscal year 21 budget, uh, included a reduction in our, our fund balance by about $1.7 million. And so in theory, if we retained more of the CARES funding, that would help plug the gap of the $1.7 million that we'll be pulling out of our rainy day funds. And yet at the same time, and, and this is, you know, I put a key question on here because I think this is really what our, our biggest concern has always been is how we balance our desire to assist the community and, and ensure that our, our local economy is strong and thriving with the need for us to maintain our, our vital services like public safety. And how do we figure out a balance point where we can and get some money out into the public, but also ensure that we have some financial stability. And then finally, our last concern was giving money to, the, to small businesses that could violate the Arizona Constitution. So just going a little bit into this, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but uh, Congress is, is really a mess, probably at all times, but especially right now. Um, the House has passed the HEROES Act. Ben, you froze.
Well, and the Senate is. leadership approved. Am I back yet? You are. You're back. I was just about to pick up where you left off. You left off at the House just passed the Heroes Act. Okay. Sorry about that. You guess. I guess the internet connection in Wyoming is a little slower than Arizona. But here we go. Um, the Heals Act is um, is proposed by Senate leadership, and the Heals Act and the Heroes Act have a lot of competing measures. There are some things that they are in agreement on, at least in terms of we should do something for these, and those are listed at the bottom. They they believe that everyone should get stimulus payments, everyone should uh, have an extension of unemployment benefits, uh, we should expand the payroll protection program or renew that, add additional funds to that. And then over $100 billion in new funding will go to schools. Now, this is all further complicated because this weekend, as, as I'm sure many of you saw, President Trump signed executive actions that uh, effectively preempted many of these, these exact type of things. And so there still will be ongoing negotiations and discussions between the executive branch as well as, as the Congress and we still don't know what that's ultimately gonna look like. Obviously in, in the executive actions that were taken this weekend, there were no additional funds for local government. So we do know that, but uh, there could still be something coming on the horizon. We, we just don't know. Um, this slide I think is, is very important. Um, we, as a result of COVID have had a lot of increased expenses. We've had to change the way that we do business. We've Unfortunately, had to close many of our facilities to the public to ensure that our public and our, our, our employees can remain healthy and safe. But also we've had extra, extra costs that we've incurred. And so I've listed as, uh, as many of these as possible on, on a slide without trying to make it too cramped. But uh, some of those are like technology upgrades. We've, we've launched a citizen complete complaint portal, at least the process of getting that um, that should be online in a few weeks where citizens will be able to make complaints online. This is hopefully making us more efficient within our organization, being able to respond quicker and be more responsive to any complaints about potholes or graffitis. Uh, we've purchased a lot of laptops so that people can telecommute and can um, remote work. We've purchased obviously personal protective equipment, plexiglass for many of our city facilities. Um, we've waived business licenses, business license fees, and, and you as, as council have, have chosen to take that action, and, and we certainly know our businesses are, are grateful for that. We've had increased jail costs due to COVID. Um, we've received notice from the Pinal County Jail that they've had to increase the, the daily rate that they charge for those that are arrested within the town. We have federally mandated leave, and this is an interesting one. A lot of times um, when the federal government uh, passes legislation, they require us to do certain things. And this is one of those occasions with the Families First Coronavirus Relief Act, they actually said anyone that is taking care of, of someone that's ill or is sick themselves that are affected by the pandemic, by the, by the virus, they get 10 paid days of leave. And so anyone within our organization that's had to go out for testing or that's um, confirmed as, as coronavirus positive, all of those would be eligible for up to 10 days of paid sick leave. And that would be something that we have to cover and, and the federal government does not pay for that. There's also associated overtime with that because if person A is out of the office, sometimes we have to backfill that position with person B. And if person B has already worked 40 hours in a week, that means they're getting overtime pay to work that extra shift. So particularly for our essential staff, in addition to that, there's also the child care aspect that the Families First Coronavirus Relief Act required, which means if your child is unable to go to care or school because the school is not providing in-person learning at this time, then they could be um, compensated for up to two thirds of their salary per day for up to 10 days again. And so all of these things have costs associated with them that are not paid for by the federal government or otherwise, and that we would have to incur Again, additional turnout gear. We've clearly had losses in revenue because we haven't been able to do certain programs. We've had the pool closed for a certain amount of time or even just the general economic slowdown. All of those things add up to, to various aspects of, of losing revenue or sales tax uh, revenue. Um, again, we've got certain things that we apply for funding through FEMA for and FEMA requires us to 
to uh, give a match, a 25% match. And so we've also had to pay the 25% match. And then we've also had event cancellations such as Country Thunder. Unfortunately, we're not having Country Thunder in 2020 and that often brings revenue to our community. And so who knows if, if we'll have the rodeo in, in this, this fall around Thanksgiving, if the Parada will still be able to go. We still don't know those type of things because we don't know where we are going to be in a couple of months. And so all of those things factor into, you know, how, where we stand today. And then finally, again, our third concern is the Arizona gift clause. The Arizona constitution states very clearly that we're not allowed to gift money to other organizations or other individuals. This is really tough for us in this time where we're trying to give aid to the community. And how do we find a way to make a, a, a payment or a loan or a grant to an organization without violating the gift clause or the intent of the gift clause? And so as, as we've gone through that and talked with the League of Cities, the League of Cities sought an opinion from the governor's office about specifically if donating these funds or granting these funds to community organizations or small businesses, if that would be in violation of the gift clause and the governor's office declined to make a, um, make a stance on, take a stance on that issue. And so then we asked the Arizona Attorney General's office and they said that they would have a conflict of interest and so they couldn't provide a legal opinion on that either because if anyone were to turn in a city or a town or a county for granting these funds to a private business saying that it were a violation of the Arizona gift clause, then the attorney general's office would be the one that would investigate that complaint. And so all that we've done has, has tried to, to find a legal framework wherein we can provide some funding to the community, but also stay legally compliant and not have a future legal challenge. Uh, ben, back to that uh, exception where you say that the monies can be provided to other entities if giving the money or subsidy promotes public a public purpose. Correct. That sounds like a big loophole. Yeah, and, and there's, there are two things, two qualifiers. And so we need to solve point A as well as point B. Point A is that it serves a public purpose, but we also must comply with point B which is that we get a direct benefit in that is equal or similar value in return. So when you, when everything we do has to follow both of those. When you say we, you mean the town or? Correct, the town as a whole, the town organization in theory, or the town community. Well, like, could, could we uh, use money to help uh, the downtown businesses? Could we sponsor grants to uh, refurbished buildings as part of the public purpose. Yeah, Council Member Anderson, I, I think that, you know, we'll, we'll kind of touch on what our recommendation is, and, and I know Cliff could certainly speak to it as well. Um, ultimately, our recommendation that, and we'll see a couple examples from other communities as well as, as to what they've done. Um, but our, our recommendation is that we're following, uh, that we provide funds that for people that are assisting in public health. Public health is clearly a government function. It's something that we are assigned to do and assigned to assist with in our very nature, in our, in our organization, our, our um, statutes that, that form cities and towns that say we must provide for the public health. And so we, we think that we are very legally defensible in providing programs that assist in the public health. And, and that's ultimately where a recommendation would be. But if you just, I guess bear with me a couple minutes, maybe I show you some of these other communities and you can get an idea of, of what other communities are doing and then we'll get to our recommendation. And I think that that might make a little bit more sense and you can see where we allow for some of that. Um, but to a certain degree, um, you know, I, I'd just be a little bit concerned about doing straight grants uh, to, to communities or organizations within the community, unless we're getting a value back in terms of the public purpose and the equal and similar value in return. Thank you. So I think I've got three communities on here and, and if you want to talk about more, we could certainly talk about more. I mean, I've, I've gone through as many communities as, as humanly possible within the last few weeks. And so um, 
these I think are, are decent uh, examples of, of what exists out in the, out in the free world. But uh, the town of Queen Creek received about $5.2 million as their allocation. Again, we received the 3.1, but they also had benefits of the Maricopa County allocation. So if Maricopa County created a program, which they did for mortgage or rent assistance, then people living within the boundaries of Queen Creek for that through Maricopa County. And so the residents of Queen Creek received $5.2 million direct, but they also had access to the greater $399 million that Maricopa County received. Um, ultimately, the Queen Creek's program was about $500,000. So it's about 10% of the total that they received as a direct allocation. And they attributed that to local businesses. So they have a grant program similar to, to what you were saying, Mr. Vice Mayor, that reimburses businesses for costs incurred in, um, in including sanitation or employee safety, customer safety, similar types of things like PPE. Um, their eligibility list included for-profit small businesses that had physical commercial addresses in Queen Creek and that held a valid Queen Creek business license. So they have very strict eligibility criteria to ensure that, that the money that they were providing to the community is able to be tracked and ensured that uh, they were, it was spent in the proper manner. And then finally, their grant money is distributed based on the number of full-time equivalent employees or contractors that the business had as, a, as of March 1st, 2020. And so if they had five employees, they received $500 per employee as a maximum up to 20, so that would be $2,500. And then the maximum award per business was $12,500. And so, their program is available on investtheqc.com slash together. Um, you could go take a look at that at, at your leisure. The city of Maricopa, obviously our, our neighbors to the west in Pinal County, they received a $6 million direct allocation. Of that, they initially allocated $1.7 million, so about 28% of the total that they received to go towards local businesses and nonprofits. Their small business reemergence program was slated at $1.35 million, and their nonprofit program was initially put at $350,000. Now, the interesting thing with the city of Maricopa is they opened their program and they closed it uh, pretty quickly. And uh, so they, they allowed for mortgage or lease payments from March to May and any PPE expenses, not including funding for lost revenue, but ultimately, they only authorized $569,000 worth of grants, which was about 10% of their total allocation of $6 million. They just didn't receive the, the number of applications that they expected to receive. And in fact, the $350,000 of nonprofits were not even within their town lim within their city limits. So they had a food bank and, and another group, not even from within their city limits, but they, um, they said that they would hold that money in reserves in case there's not enough money. So they haven't directly allocated that money yet, but up to 350,000, which means if you take the 350 out, they only had about $200,000 of, of uh, grant applications from businesses within their actual community. And then finally, we'll look at Scottsdale. Again, Scottsdale had a $29.6 million direct benefit Plus, they also had access to the $399 million from Maricopa County, similar to Queen Creek. Um, they set aside $8.5 million to local businesses. You know, that, that might be a little inflated because $3 million of that was for care for vulnerable citizens. So you could, in fact, say that that's $5.5 million, but I just included that in there. So about 29% of their total went to local businesses and 71% of their expenses went to, or 71% of their allocation went to city expenses. Anything from new air filters and air filtration and sanitization of their HVAC systems to PPE to uh, future preparation for response to COVID. Lots of different things that they specifically allocated those remaining 71% of funds to. So with that, we've created our own recommendation, and that is, as I mentioned earlier, to reimburse expenses that have assisted in improving the public health within the town of Florence. So under the US Treasury guidance, this money has to be spent by December 31st. 
And we wanted to make sure that we could get it out as quickly as possible, but also um, provide a, a legislative action that would allow for the council to kind of um, have that extra step of, of protection. And so uh, we recommend receiving applications through October 31st and providing grants to the community. And the guidelines would basically be that you'd require a physical brick and mortar storefront or a facility within the town limits because we don't want to duplicate any program that's existed otherwise. So if, for example, um, they were in Santan Valley, they had access to the Pinal County program that, that recently completed. So in order to check that, we'd also make sure that town businesses would have a business license as of January 1st and wanna make sure that they're still in business and, and still have a currently valid um, business license. And then again, our recommendation would be to not reimburse for any lost revenue, but to receive receipts. And for us, receiving receipts is a big thing because as we uh, process any payment requests, and if our auditor comes to us and say, well, why did you spend $6,000 over here? We can show the receipt saying, this was part of our Florence Grants Program, Florence Cares Grant Program, and they were assisting with public health process. And so we could easily defend that as, as we are audited every year. Um, we would also recommend that it be a small business as defined by the, by the Small Business Act. And their, their um, definitions within the federal code and similar to the Queen Creek plan, provide up to $500 per employee reimbursement and or utility payment, up to $10,000 per business. And so what we wanna see and, and what our recommendation would be is to reimburse any expenses for personal protective equipment, any capital expense where you're making some physical change to your building or to your business to help protect the public from COVID. So if that's you know, putting up plexiglass or stickers on the ground or if you're creating additional outdoor seating so that you can uh, keep people spread out, those type of things, uh, we, we could certainly reimburse if we had the receipts for those. But then also additionally, a utility payment uh, we would recommend as well, where a business could apply for reimbursement for their water, wastewater, or electric utility payments from the months of March, April, or May. And the reason that it would be for those months is because those were the months where we had the stay at home order in place. And so in theory, those are assisting in public health by paying those, those payments. Now what they do with it after they get that reimbursement, again, this is vice mayor where, where we kind of get to your point. If, if a business applies for $10,000 in reimbursement because they had uh, large utility bills in March, April, and May, and they have you know over 20 employees, they'd be eligible for, for up to $10,000 once they get that reimbursement, in theory, they could use that money however they want because we have then allocated that funds and we've assisted in public health. Now we pay it uh, to assist in public health, but ultimately what they do with it um, would, be, would be their business. And so uh, we would recommend up to $10,000 per business and then capping the total grant amount at $300,000, which is about 10% of our total allocation of $3.1 million we would recommend doing that on a first come first served basis. So we'd want the applications in quickly. We'd want to turn them over and, and get the money out as quickly as possible. Again, these are, are some of the types of things that, that we would look to um, be reimbursing for anything from disinfection or signage, air filters, physical barriers, PPE, even employment expenses. If they had extra expenses to go find employees, um, those are some of the things that, that we, could, we could feel justified in reimbursing. And then, as I mentioned, the stay at home months of March, April, and May, if, if they had those utility costs for water, wastewater, and electric utilities, which are required under the Arizona State Constitution to be provided to protect public health. Uh, if you're, for example, a landlord, you have to have at least water, wastewater, and electrical utility in the house. And then again, this is the second aspect you have either or, and you can do both, uh, PPE and utility payment, both are part of the public health assistance grant that uh, we would recommend doing. And so a business would be eligible for a total of $10,000 based off of the number of employees with that business. And so we'd simply create an application, um, list the number of employees that you have, um, and, and provide some additional information uh, as required and then provide the receipts. And hopefully 
that would be a little bit easier for us as a reimbursement program, as opposed to some sort of a grant program where we would have to, or sorry, as opposed to a loan program where we would have to track expenses, track payments coming back. Um, we certainly think the grant program would be easier to manage, would take less staff time, and would be quicker to get money into the hands of the small businesses that are, are looking for it. So the basic application and approval process would be that a business would apply. Um, there would be a review board appointed by the town manager that would consist of someone from finance, grants, legal, and administration that would review the eligibility criteria and ensure that each business is meeting those criteria. They would get the receipts and make sure that, for example, if they have 20 employees that they are eligible for up to 10,000, but nothing more. And then the review board would make a recommendation to the town council at the next available town council meeting. And again, this would be probably on the consent agenda where we would maybe list seven or eight businesses or 12 businesses or however many businesses have applied in that two week span. We'd get them on the agenda so that the council could both see where these funds are going as well as be the approving authority and having a legislative act to send these, these funds out into the community where you are approving uh, funds to be spent for effectively public health. So if every two weeks, the council would have a chance to review those recommendations as the applications are received and processed through the review board, uh, those would go on the council agenda. And then similar process with the um, utility reimbursement, um, might've gone back a slide. So ultimately town staff, can adapt this recommendation to, to your all's desire. If, if you want to add or subtract or add funds or take away funds or, or whatever, we are at your disposal. We simply wanted to provide a recommendation based off of the many different communities that we've reviewed and uh, the best practices with, with our legal understanding based off of the complicated situation that we find ourselves in. And that while also balancing as best we can the need for, for our local economy to succeed and thrive. So with that, Mayor and Council, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ben. I'm going to first ask Council if they have any questions for Ben at this time. Well, I have a question about the HVAC uh, for our, our older buildings downtown. Uh, does this mean that they could apply for a grant to get uh, funding to put air conditioning or up upgrade their air conditioning systems? Vice Mayor, uh, to a certain degree, um, what we're really looking for and what you see one of the criteria in the eligibility based off our recommendation is the installation and or maintenance of HVAC systems to include, include the MERV 13 or higher air filters. So what this is really focusing on is providing better quality air and providing air within the facility that has been scrubbed of, of potential virus particles. And so, what the um, CDC recommends is, is a MERV 13 filtration system, a fine particle filtration system, or even UV sanitization systems. Um, the city of Scottsdale, for example, one of the portions of their 71% of funding that they retained was putting uh, UV sanitization in 76 different facilities at a cost of about $125,000 per facility. And so they spent millions of dollars doing that, but that was something that they did to improve the, the health within their facility. So not necessarily uh, purchasing a brand new HVAC system, but if there's an upgrade to, um, I guess, provide a healthier air quality within the facility, then that would be eligible. Good, thank you. Council member Wallace. Yeah, I have a question about the I have a couple of questions. They're kind of disjointed, so I apologize. I have notes all over the place. Um, one thing I would like to hear when we're all finished with council questions is what the businesses who may be listening or participating in this work session uh, feel is their greatest need. Um, also, is there consideration included in this program for nonprofits? Um, and would businesses that received other sources of grants or loans be considered or would they be disqualified? Um, let's see what else. 
Um, I liked your reference to public health assistance grant. Uh, I thought that was a great uh, title for what we may be offering here. Um, and I think that was the only, the only questions I wrote down that you haven't already answered. Thank you. Yeah, thanks council member wall and I'll try to address all of those as best I can. Um, first of all, as it relates to nonprofits, I did include, I did create a slide or two just to talk about nonprofits, expecting that that question may come up. It's come up in discussion in, in many other communities and the council meetings that I've watched there. And so um, for our recommendation, in terms of our recommendation, the idea for providing funding to small businesses is tied to the belief, and, and I'm just reading this verbatim because I think it's so important, but it's tied to the belief that small businesses have been the hardest hit during these times. While certainly nonprofits have um, been hit, they've also received extra amounts of funding and extra um, access to additional pots. And so they had access to PPP, they had access to charitable giving incentives, the economic injury disaster loan, employee retention tax credit, unemployment benefit reimbursement, economic stabilization fund amongst others. And not all small businesses were eligible for all of these different programs. And so as we looked at the various different funding mechanisms, um, we certainly saw that, that there was some disparity there that we wanted really to make sure our small businesses um, had access to funds. So also the, the last point is real important on this slide. Providing funding for nonprofits is very complicated because there are 25 different types of nonprofits under federal tax code. So do you provide funding to schools, churches, employee unions or credit unions or amateur sports organizations? It's very hard to draw a line because some of those are 501c3s, other have a specific designation as a 501c6 or a c12 or um, various different aspects within the tax code. And so defining a nonprofit is very difficult and that's why I think a lot of communities have, have steered clear of the nonprofit wing, just because it becomes much more difficult in terms of who you're going to distribute it to while ensuring that you're going to create a fair program for, for all nonprofits that are eligible under those criteria. And so finally, what I would say with that is if you were to consider nonprofits for further funding, we'd really want to narrow that down um, to something that would say you'd have to have a storefront or a brick and mortar building within the town of Florence that the grants would be similar to the public safety. Or Ben, again. Again. Ben you're frozen. Lost you in. Give them a moment to get back on. Your public health grant that, that we just discussed for small businesses and it has to tell the kids to stop using YouTube. <laughs> so, can everyone hear me all right? Yes, Are we back? Sir. Okay, churches, sorry. Well, where would churches fall? Would they be considered a nonprofit? Again, yeah, that's, that's one of the definitions within the um, federal tax code. They are considered a nonprofit. And so, um, we'd, we'd really have to narrow that down and this kind of goes, Council Member Wall, to your other question. They would have to certify that they've not received any additional funding through the federal government. So through the payroll protection program. And if we were to make a recommendation for nonprofits, that would be an additional step uh, that, that I think would be valuable for nonprofits. The reason I wouldn't recommend that, that step for small businesses is because in all of the town of Florence, we had one business receive a uh, Paycheck Protection Program grant greater than $150,000. And we had just a little over 60 receive grants of less than $150,000. And so there are fewer than 60 businesses within the town of Florence that have received any Paycheck Protection Program. And we don't get to know the names of those, but some of those are nonprofits. And we just, we just because of the, the transparency that uh, the Small Business Administration has, I guess, lacked in terms of the smaller PPP loans, we don't know whether Small Business A has received that loan or whether Small Business B has received that, received that loan. But we do know that there are nonprofits within the town of Florence that have already received some loans. And so our recommendation would be that the nonprofits 
specifically would have to certify that they haven't received any additional funding in that respect. And then I think that the, the safest way to do it would be to set a cap on both small businesses as well as a cap on nonprofits to ensure that the majority of that money or, or the, the bulk of that money is getting out into the small businesses and being rejuvenated throughout our economy again. And so if, if that meant 250,000 and 50,000 or however you wanna split that up, that would certainly be your prerogative, but I would certainly recommend having two different pots for nonprofits and small businesses if that were the direction um, to go with nonprofits as well. And can I ask you a question, a clarifying question for a moment? Absolutely. Did you say that the nonprofits we know who has and who has not received, whereas the small businesses we don't know for certain who has or who has not received? No, the, the Small Business Administration only released information for specific businesses that received loans above $150,000. And so we have a list of all Florence businesses, their code, so what type of business they are, uh, but we don't have the names of the businesses for those that received loans under $150,000. And so when we go and look at the codes, we can see that there are numerous nonprofits that received loans of under $150,000, but we do not know who those are, whether they're nonprofits or small businesses. So if we're going to ask nonprofits to certify that they have not received, why wouldn't we also ask the same of small businesses? And I'm not saying that they wouldn't be eligible altogether, but I do know for certain that we have small businesses that have applied and some have received some have applied multiple times, they have received nothing. And I would just, you know, not be happy with the business that had not received anything. And yet here's this business that had already received. I don't want to see that be the case. Yeah, Mayor, and, and we certainly could do that and we'd be happy to do that. Our intent, we created the recommendation was more getting the money quickly. And that's why we recommended the first come first serve. If we were for example, ask our small businesses, if you've already received paycheck protection program loan um, to maybe wait until after those that haven't received those funds, then effectively we'd be waiting until the end of that period in October to make sure that everyone that has not received funds gets first preference. And so we certainly could do that. And Mayor, again, that's that's something that you all have, have the, the ability to provide that direction to us. But what we were trying to do is just provide the, the dollars as quickly as possible. I appreciate that. Yeah, Mayor, that if I may. Council Member Wall, did that answer all your questions? Well, other than the fact that I would like to hear from some of the businesses who may be online or perhaps the chamber, uh, representative who's online as to the feedback that we're hearing from our businesses and what their greatest needs are. Mr. Beatty, are you online at this time? Here, one moment. I'm allowing the public to talk. Madam Mayor, I am. Can you, I, I assume I'm unmuted? Yes, you are unmuted, sir. Yeah, and I, I thank you for the, for the time to talk. I'll talk just briefly on what Karen says. Um, I, quite honestly, I think everybody kind of knows that a lot of their expenses and what their worries are right now are not doing the protection, not putting up the plexiglass is just a lack of sales from being closed since March um, or a lack of people coming out, um, especially on Main Street that some of them are doing okay. But, you know, they've, they've been shuttered and people have been inside their houses for, for months. So us saying that we're going to spend up to $500 per employee with how many of the businesses on Main Street have more than two employees or three employees is a, I would say not to be rude. I mean, that's nice, but it's a little bit of a slap in the face to say, oh, here's, you know, $500 because you have one employee bucks for styles or $2,000 for rail three because they have two employees or one and a half. Um, and then, you know, here's more money for, for kind of stuff to, to save the public, I, I, I don't know. It just seems a little bit, um, uh, not, not, nothing against you, Ben, but not really thought out well. I understand, the, I understand the purpose, but if we're really gonna help the businesses, 
uh, reimbursing them for what you've mentioned so far is not going to help them. One of the points that I had written down is that for the small businesses with a relatively low number of employees, $500 per employee really doesn't do much. Um, I would rather see us develop some kind of a sliding scale so that if a business has, say, one to eight or ten employees, that it's, you know, $1,000 or $1,500 per employee, and then over ten, it's a little bit less per employee. Uh, the proportionate cost per employee, uh, I think, is higher for the smaller businesses than it is for the larger businesses, I think, just in terms of economies of scale. That's my personal opinion. Thank you, Council Member Wall. I agree with uh, Karen because the other thing you got to consider: some of these businesses are run by families, and uh, you know they may not be employees per se because they may not get paid a salary. Very valid point. And, and Mayor, if I may, um, just real quickly. We, we certainly don't disagree with, with, Ro, with what Roger's saying and what the council members have suggested could certainly adapt the program that way. The one uh, concern I do have is in terms of the comment about lack of sales, that's a loss of revenue, right? And, and we're experiencing that, everyone's experiencing that, and, and that's really hard for, for everyone right now. But unfortunately, under the CARES Act, there is specific guidance from the US Department of Treasury that says that these funds cannot be used for the replacement of revenue. And so for replacement of lost revenue. And so what we've tried to do is create a program that, that generally everyone may be, may be applicable. Everyone has utility bills and so they can receive a reimbursement for those utility bills. And after they receive those funds, it's up to them where they spend it or how they spend it. Or if it goes towards, towards their bank account, you know, once it clears us, then it's, then it's their determination. But we found a way that, that we felt legally comfortable where we could provide funds to the community. And I understand that, Ben, I apologize. I didn't mean to say that we needed to reimburse them for their lack of sales, but the question was posed on what their biggest concern is. And like I said, you know, getting plexiglass up for, I don't even know how much a sheet of plexiglass costs, $50, we're gonna reimburse them for that is not really going to help. When, can I, since I'm on, am I, if I'm still off on mute or off mute? You're still off mute. I was going to ask you specifically, what suggestions do you have? Because I had communicated with surrounding municipal mayors and today was able to get that information in the hands of all council members regarding the programs that they have put together, some of the creativeness, but that had not been to them prior so maybe an hour before the meeting. So that being said, you know, there's definitely some additional material that can be read and some additional discussions to be had. However, in your position, what specific suggestions would you have for us? Well, and not, not to, uh, like, well, just my biggest suggestion when I was going to come through is some kind of um, marketing campaign that the town could do. A number of, you know, you didn't mention Casa Grande, which is putting some money and I'm not saying this because the Costa Grande is giving it to the chamber, but a number of these cities are doing big marketing campaigns. That's the best, you know, that I'm sure we could figure out a way that safety or something like that, but bringing people to town, telling them what's going on, which we haven't done anyway, but um, you know, some kind of marketing, big marketing push uh, shop local. Um, there's a number of ways of getting, of getting to that, but bringing people to town. I understand that, um, you know, that some of these events may or may not be happening, which, you know, we need to talk about in another call, but, you know, some of this bringing people to Florence, a lot of people are, you know, taking driving vacations or, you know, rather than flying anywhere, this is the key time to be getting people from all over Arizona to be driving through beautiful Florence and doing some activities outside, some hiking and stopping by lunch and going shopping. Um, it's kind of a key moment to be doing a little bit of advertising because everybody's a little stir crazy right now. So that probably would be my biggest thing. Yes, I would love for you to give, you know, $50,000 to every small business that has a business license within Florence, but I understand we can't. But um, I do appreciate Karen's idea of a sliding scale, helping out as much as possible. 
Um, but that would be my suggestion on a, on a quick thought. Appreciate your feedback. Council Member Cortez? Um, yeah, so I have a couple of things. I know I spoke um, to Supervisor Goodman on Friday about what they were doing and, you know, they rolled their money out two weeks after getting it. So um, they've been in it a little bit longer. And they originally set out with uh, 15,000 was their max, but they raised it to 30,000. And they're using it as grants for overhead. So rent, utilities, um, they're looking at possibly even seeing if it could help cover uh, property taxes. The one thing that he did say that I made sure I clarified with him was that if you are in the town of Florence, you will not qualify for Pinal County's money. So I know I heard that comment, something about, you know, like, oh, they're gonna get money. They won't, the FUD shop and all, none of them will be able to get money from Pinal County because they're expecting us to help them. So I want to make sure that that, that part was clear because I don't want anybody to think they, um, we aren't going to give them something because we're expecting Pinal because they're not going to help our businesses. It's our job to help them. Um, I know that we can't help with payroll, but we can help with rent. We can help with utilities. So there's a way that we can significantly help these businesses beyond a $500 and it shouldn't be dependent on how many employees they have. It could just be that each business can qualify up to this amount and you have to justify how much your rent is during that time, how much your utilities are during that time. So if a business can show us that they have $7,000 and our max is 10, then they would qualify for that 7,000. Or if they can only prove to us that they've got $600 and that's what they would be able to qualify. But if we could, you know, in that time frame, set up that these are the, the four months or whatever, I mean, we're into August and this has started basically in March. So we're, you know, we're quite a bit into it. I don't want to just say, oh, you only qualify for two months or you only qualify for three months. Nobody knows when this is going to end. So the more we can help our businesses, the better, because they are struggling and they're not struggling just because of COVID expenses. They're struggling because people are being scared to come out of their house. They're being told don't come out. And so they're, they're not getting people in, but we're asking them to keep their doors open. We're asking them to help us, you know, Roger wants to do a campaign. Well, that campaign isn't going to help us if we close our businesses down. So they're staying open to help this town survive. So we need to give back to them um, and make sure that we're helping them out. And I know that the uh, PPP was mentioned. And when I talked to Pinal County and when I talked to Apache Junction, the PPP did not have a factor in if you received the funds from them because that was for payroll protection, which that's why they set it up where it would only cover your overhead. So if you received the PPP, that still didn't um, nullify you from receiving money from them because that's not, that's not what we're trying to cover. We're not trying to cover your payroll. We're trying to help you cover some of the other expenses and you know, if you did go and buy masks and sanitizers and all that, you know, if we tell them, make a list of everything you've done, plus add your rent and all this, we might be surprised at the money that these businesses with an employee of one have actually spent. It, it's been a significant amount and any little bit will help that we can give them. And I just want to make sure that our businesses have a fighting chance in this because if we lose another business on Main Street, I don't know what our main street will be, we might as well just roll it up and close, close it down because we can't afford it. We can't afford to lose any more businesses in this town. So those are the kind of the points I had. And then um, even if we were to kind of factor in what, what kind of business did they do last year? I, I know we're not supposed to factor in revenue, but that would help us gauge how COVID has really impacted their business and would help us maybe understand how we could help them better so that they can survive. That was my, thank you. You're welcome. I wonder why, and I, I hear what you're saying about Maricopa County, Pinal County, Maricopa County, their elected officials chose to help people that even were in municipal boundaries, whereas Pinal County only is moving forward with helping people in unincorporated areas. So I just think that that's one 
point that needs to be put out there so everybody is aware. Madam Mayor, can I ask one more question before he mutes me again? <laughs> yeah, um, and, and Ben, maybe this is probably to Ben. Um, is there a way of including businesses that don't have brick and mortar? Um, I feel that those probably have been maybe hit hardest and then those are the ones that kind of lead to, lead to Main Street fabrics and other things that, you know, Chris, I won't go through all the other ones that are very, very close to looking to rent and have been looking to rent on Main Street and, and around. But if we're going to not help them and ignore them, you know, they're gone and there goes more, you know, more potential on Main Street. Is there, has there been thought on that? Yeah, Thank you. Mayor Roger and, and members of the council, again, our program was de designed in a way that would be the most legally defensible while also providing the, the maximum benefit that, that we could provide to the community. And so when we look at legally defensible, that's where we came up with the term uh, public health or not. We didn't come up with that. That's what we read in statute. And as we read that term and, and followed it through and said, how do we assist in the public health of our community and ensure that these grants are not used for things that will potentially create a lawsuit for our community down the road? How do we ensure that all of these monies are going to go towards public health? One of those things is if you don't have a brick and mortar, you're not assisting in the public health because nobody is coming to your uh, location because you don't have a location or it may be out of your home where you're not having that, that uh, public interaction. And so where you have a brick and mortar presence, that allows for us to say, you know what, if you put in PPE, if you put in active equipment, some, some capital equipment, sneeze guards or what have you, we can justify reimbursement of those expenses because they fit in the legal definition of assisting in the public health. And that's why, again, we went with the, for utilities, just water, wastewater, and electric, because those are found in the statutory definition of public health. Um, and we didn't make the recommendation for rents or mortgages along those same lines, because some people own their businesses outright, or their facilities, their buildings outright, don't have a rent and a mortgage. So if we were to pay rents and mortgages, it might be unfair for those. And and does a rent or a mortgage really assist in the, in the public health? And so what we've tried to do is, is narrow it down as best we could to, to limit the town's liability for any future challenge. And, and I'm sure if, if, if you wanted to ask Cliff, our legal expert, about that, then, then he certainly could uh, expand on that. I'm just providing my uh, Holiday Inn Express opinion in terms of the legal opinion. But, but certainly as, as we've developed this program, I worked very closely, closely with Cliff um, and with our, our legal team and advisors. And as we looked at other programs, we found uh, and discussed with, with city and town staff across the state what they felt that the weaknesses in their programs were and tried to incorporate a program that would be the best of all worlds for what we could recommend. Now, certainly that doesn't mean it's a perfect program. Obviously, there's, there have been suggestions tonight that, that certainly are reasonable. All of them are reasonable. And that's, that's your admirable job as a council member to to make those recommendations and changes that you think are gonna be better for the community. But going back to, to Roger's comment, that's, that's why we didn't include those things and, and why we framed the, the program the way we did is because we wanted it to be legally defensible and we wanted to get those funds out to the businesses as quickly as possible. Is there a way, Ben, and I haven't looked at this statutorily yet, but is there a way where we could coordinate and work with the chamber in a much similar manner how we do with the IDA in regards of having them facilitate the funding in regards to being a pass-through? I'm aware that Superior is utilizing local Arizona first to distribute some of their funds. And considering we already have a contract in place, how does, how does that fit? Yeah, Mayor, Council Members, Again, for us, it's, it's very difficult um, in the legal definition based off of the funds that we're receiving. These are federal funds with specific, um, I mean, the, the treasury guidance is very specific about what it can and cannot be used for. And so there's not really provisions wherein we feel comfortable that we can just provide this to other organizations. This has been delegated, delegated, delegated to us to reimburse for our public safety expenses. Now, how we choose to move on from that must still follow the, the federal guidelines, 
guidelines because this is federal funds and those guidelines kind of just trickle down until the ultimate recipient. And so well, again, what, what we've provided, provided is just what we feel is the most legally defensible program. Now speaking also, um, our department heads are all here. Have we heard from our department heads in regards to what they need? Because part of this funding is also going to cross over into the programs and the services that we provide to our community. So could you speak um, to that? Yeah, Mayor, Council Members, we've talked at length uh, about this topic with our, our executive team, with all of our department directors. We actually have walked through this presentation before tonight with our directors to ensure that they were all aware of what our recommendation would be and to receive their input about, you know, what might be surprises coming up, what are extra expenses. And so as you kind of go back about midway through the presentation where we talked about how we've had increased expenses, that was all input from our department directors. So if, if some felt, you know, in our, our public safety side that we have mobile radios that we need to purchase that have become even more important under this, this type of a pandemic where we've been in, under an emergency order for now six months, almost six months, um, that some of these things have risen to the surface more than they may have otherwise. And so we've, we tried to include as much of those as possible on that slide earlier that talked about the increased expenses, but we just, we don't know what may be coming. We don't know how long this lasts. And, and that's very similar feeling to, to our small businesses and to our, our whole community. You know, we'd, we'd love to snap our fingers and have it all be done with and not have to worry about it anymore, but that's not reality. And so we've just tried to create the, the best program we could and best recommendation for you all. And then we'll make the adjustments as, as you deem fit. Hello, if I may. Oh, hang on one quick sec. Go ahead, Council Member Larson. Yeah, I haven't gotten to say anything yet. So I've been trying to raise my hand over here. Sorry. Oh. Um, so I just had some questions. <laughs> I just had some questions real quick. Um, I guess I'm getting frustrated because to me, 10% is not enough. So I don't know where the other 90%, I know we obviously have our expenses too, but where the rest of those funds are going to go. I agree with the sentiments that everybody has said here that this is not enough. Um, I do want to include the nonprofits. I like the suggestions that were offered before. Um, I believe it has to be a brick and mortar type nonprofit um, as well as I don't know if there is a way to tie it in legally with giving back to the community, but I feel like that should be a standard if they're providing a service to the community that they normally wouldn't have provided or maybe not up to those same standards. Um, and they've upped them because of the pandemic. I feel that that's a good qualifier um, to tr if legally we can give them funds and that to me seems like a good, a good thing. Um, as far as back to John's point about the AC units, to me that's a justifiable expense. If somebody has to put in an AC unit and, that, and they didn't previously even have one, that's something that I don't see why we wouldn't cover. Um, because if that AC unit now is adding filtration to their property that they wouldn't have normally had, they are protecting public by having that filtered unit. So to me, there is a lot of exceptions. I don't want us to, to rein in this money so tight that we're, we are giving just little pebbles to these, to these businesses. I want to make sure we are providing um, the funds where they're justified legally, but also where they are in their pocket and they can use them however they wish. Um, once they're there. I, I don't know the legalities as to why other entities are able to provide for rent coverage and why we wouldn't, but to me that's another opportunity for us to explore and I'd like us to explore that, especially if we're seeing other municipalities offer that um, to some extent. Um, to me, I would like to increase the cap as well. I don't like um, such a low cap on the amounts as, as well, but um, yeah, I guess uh, to me, I feel like there's a lot more of this discussion needs to be had because the examples that are provided, although they were great, they weren't all, all inclusive. I think that uh, Mayor Walter said that she sent out other ones. I haven't even had a chance to see those, to be honest. So they might have been sent an hour ago, but I didn't get them. So um, I'd like an opportunity to review those as well. But I feel like this isn't enough for me on paper. I like it's a good starting point, but it's not quite enough. I don't think we're there. And I agree. And what I was going to add just before you spoke also, I didn't know if you had had an opportunity to take into account how many employees we have 
if every employee needed to take that up to 10 days COVID leave. Um, and I also, if I'm remembering correctly in the federal guidelines, since the schools are closed, an employee can take up to 12 weeks of paid leave at two thirds percent of their take home pay to take care of their children. And if I read it correctly, it would come from that COVID CARES funding. So I just wanna make sure we're allocating and planning, you know, what we're responsible for regarding, you know, employee wise, as well as business wise, as well as public safety wise and resurgence. So there's so many layers to this that it's imperative that we really analyze all of them. And, and I guess, Mayor, if, if that was a question, I could certainly uh, take a little bit of it in terms of the, the resurgence aspect. We did look at what costs would be if, um, I, I, I wouldn't say all of our employees took COVID leave. We hoped we could control the uh, the spread of COVID a little bit more than having all of our employees out on, on 10 days. I am going to say we've done a fantastic job of implementing measures and I believe in talking to surrounding municipalities, we have the lowest cases of employees who have contracted COVID. Yes, that's correct. And and I, I wholeheartedly agree with that sentiment. And you know, we've, we've certainly looked at the financial costs of that um, and they could be a million dollars, frankly. I mean. That's just the, the COVID leave and, and paying, you know, 10, 10 days of leave for every single one of our employees could hit almost a million dollars. And so uh, that doesn't include the child care. Uh, that's the two thirds of the salary. Um, and, and then the associated overtime that's the, that goes with that. And so there certainly are a lot of costs. Um, nearly every city that I've seen is setting aside half of all of their funding for something that may exist in the future. And they don't know what that is yet. They don't know uh, what it could be. It could be payment for, for that, uh, that extra leave that's required under the federal government. Or it could be for extra large capital expenses that are required to purchase. You know, it comes out, the CDC says tomorrow, you need to remove all air conditioning systems. Well, that's not necessarily feasible in Arizona. And so how would you come up with a solution? And that might be individual swamp coolers in every room or something. And so... You know, there could be any variety of things that pop up in the future. And so nearly every single community has set aside 50% for uh, future expenses and then about 25% for existing expenses, um, up to 45% of, of existing expenses. And so um, some communities, even Coolidge, just our immediate neighbor to the south, um, isn't allocating any funds to the community because they feel this is the one chance that they get to get funding for the city organization and they need to protect the funds and, and their revenues as best as possible. So we've tried to manage the best we can in, in terms of providing balance between how we, we are responsive to the public, how we get our local economy, how we get a jump start as, as best we can while still protecting our vital services. Thank you, that was perfect. I, um... Can I jump in real fast? Yeah. So ahead. of the 300,000, let's say um, we don't allocate that much out, that for whatever reason, there's, we don't get people um, submitting for the grant, where would the rest of that money go? And again, Mayor, Council Member Cortez, what, what I would say to that is all of these funds were again received based off of our anticipated public safety expenses. And so what we know is that we will spend more than $3.1 million from March 1st until December 31st in our response to COVID. So uh, what, what I would say is, is that we could certainly say that that would go towards our costs of, of fighting the COVID pandemic. Now, there have been some communities that have done specific allocations saying we're going to um, use any extra funds, any leftover funds, and, and pay down our PSPRS debt communities are certainly in much worse positions than we are in terms of that PSPRS pension obligation. And so um, they felt that that was a specific thing that they could earmark any extra funds to um, if, if they didn't quite get the amount of grant applications that they anticipated. And, so, and that would be up to the council as a whole, uh, created the, the basic guidelines in terms of it coming to the community, coming to our organization 
and then us providing that that basic basic funding opportunity for the businesses within the community. So I guess for me, um, I struggle with the wrapping my mind around um, the increased expenses that the town um, utilized to justify the 3.1 million. So I would like to see like, why does fire have increased expenses? Is their overtime really that much more than it would normally be? Um, you know, I'm just sitting there thinking, do people call the ambulance when they think they have COVID or do they drive themselves to the hospital? Every person that I've seen drove themselves to the hospital. They didn't have fire respond to them. So in my mind, I'm, and I'm sure there's a lot of people out there in the public that are going, how did fire, how did the police department increase their expenses because of COVID different than what our businesses have had to do, you know, buying hand sanitizer, buying masks, things like that. I struggle with saying, oh, we need radios. Well, we, we've been buying radios and we budget for how many we're willing to buy. So to take money to buy more radios to me is disrespectful to people who are just trying to cover the, the true expense of COVID, not that, oh, well, we, we could really use these. So we're gonna throw these in as a COVID expense. And I'm not trying to be disrespectful to anybody. I'm just trying to tell you what the public is probably sitting at home thinking like, well, where's the added expenses at? Because we're not, I don't see them, they don't see them. And unless somebody sh shows me the spreadsheet pointing out to me where the increase was and can show me that that it hasn't that that only is there because of COVID, then it's difficult to wrap your mind around it. Um, so I would like to see that, and I think you know, like Kristen said or Councilwoman Larson said, we didn't get these other towns' numbers until 5:30, and our meeting started at six, and I was in my car, so I haven't even gotten a chance to look at them. I only know Apache Junction, and I only know Pinal County because I reached out to them on Friday myself. Um, so I think we need more time to be able to look at numbers to get numbers put in front of us. It's one thing that um, staff looks at these numbers and you guys all have these great conversations amongst yourselves. You might talk to the mayor, but the rest of council is not included in these conversations. So what little bit the mayor gets is more than the rest of us, but I'm sure she hasn't seen everything either. So I think we all need to have a very clear, transparent, picture of what our expenses are, why you're justifying that of $3.1 million, we're only willing to set aside $300,000 for our businesses and with very strict guidelines that I don't see other um, cities or the counties following those same guidelines. And if somebody should be concerned about being sued, it should be the ones that got a lot of money because they're out there giving them to the food bank. Um, they're giving them to nonprofits. They're giving it to businesses to cover expenses that aren't falling under what our guidelines are saying. So I think we're being a little too restrictive. I get we don't want to get sued. I, I get that because we don't need any lawsuits. But I want us to be as giving as we can. And I want to make sure that at the end of the day, our businesses and our residents don't say the town only took care of the town municipality and they didn't care about the residents and they didn't care about the businesses because when I stood in front of the supervisors, I didn't ask for this money for, to recoup our fees. I stood there and I fought for our businesses. So to hear that of that 3.1 million, I fought for 300,000, I'm kind of like going, give me a break. Like that's not why I stood up and made myself uncomfortable because I don't like to do public speaking like that. That's not why, you know, I went there. I went there to fight for these businesses. I went there to fight for the flood shop, for Rail 3 Ranch, for the, uh, the hardware store, for, you know, the, the, all the mechanic shop, for McDonald's. I don't care if you're a big business or a little business. You're still a business in Florence, and you're still helping us stay on the map. So that's who I fought for, and that's who I'm going to continue to fight for. I'm sorry, but... If somebody needs radios, we will try to get you some more when we have the money, but I don't feel that this money should be allocated for that. I don't feel it should be allocated to revamp air conditioning units within our own town buildings. Um, I don't feel like that's what it should be for. It should be to help our town in a better way than what we have been doing. And oh, and one suggestion before I forget, on that committee, that review committee that it, for the grants, 
if we could have like a community member at large also be on that committee um, to help with transparency so that you know it's clear that everyone's best interest was being looked for and it not just be staff members. Okay, I'm just gonna pop in really quick just to kind of clarify a few things. Um, just because you had mentioned communications, what has been presented by staff has been presented by staff. Like they put that agenda out, they have done the research. What I sent you before the meeting, I have been reaching out to our surrounding municipal mayors and agencies. I myself have not had an opportunity, as you can see the timestamp on the original email. I haven't even gone through all of them. We've had plenty of conversations, but I asked for them to send it to us so we could have their programs and what they have implemented as well. So I don't want anybody to have any type of misunderstanding that there's information that's not being circulated ahead of time. I literally just got that information and passed it right along. Um, I just wanna go back to that one slide, Ben, that you had in regards to the CARE Act funding. Because again, I think that it is important. Yes, we have this $3.1 million, which is a blessing. And we all advocated, you know, Michelle, I know you spoke at the Pinal County uh, meeting. I worked with David Cook. We coordinated through the governor's office. There's still money, in my opinion, that municipalities are due above and beyond the $3.1 million. However, I am grateful that we have this, and this is a good issue to have, and this is a hard dilemma in regards to how we're going to choose to expend those funds. But if you go to the slide, I don't know what it is. It says CARES Act funding. I think it's one behind. It talks about like individual relief. Yeah, there it is. Nope. Okay. Individual relief, 300 billion, where we had the direct payments to the taxpayers. And that was up to 1200 per adult, 500 each dependent. So, you know, my point in going back to this slide is, is this enough? No, it's not enough. Some people that didn't need it received it and, you know, they passed it forward and they gifted it to nonprofits in the community. They turned around, they helped other people out with it. Um, but it, I just wanted to kind of redirect to say, you know, we did have additional programs that helped. This is above and beyond what was already out there to help. And I think we need to look at what do we have here and how do we want to utilize it? Now, the one consistent, and I only have this from communication, I haven't read through those documents yet, is they have set aside anywhere between 10 and 28% in regards to help businesses in the communities. Now, how we go about that, I'm open. I don't know if what Roger suggested is something that we could do, Ben, in regards to the shopping local, the marketing campaign to bring people in. I know when I just glanced through Superior's documents, you know, that was something that they had also incorporated as well. But again, this is something that I know that you were very involved with intrinsically all the way up through, you know, reading that legislature that came forward with it. Yeah, Mayor, and, and again, and Cliff may be better to speak about what programs may or may not qualify. Um, I would just, again, our, our legal framework is that we're trying to provide for the public health. That's all that these grants are meant to do is, is to assist public health. Now, on the side benefit, there's also extra money getting into our local economy that these small businesses that have so desperately needed it are going to get funds. But it's been really difficult road to try and get this fund first out of Congress to the state and then from the state down to our local level. You know, as, as mayor, you're certainly aware in signing a, a letter to with, with mayors from across the state to the governor to release the funds and council member court going to Pinal County Superior or Superior Court, the Board of Supervisors, to uh, to also talk about the same issue and and to make the recommendation that that they actually go forward with the lawsuit against the governor's office who had not released any funds. Those ultimately made those those actions ultimately made the governor's office release the funds. Now he didn't release them how we would have loved. We would have loved to just see dollars without any strings or. You know, to, to say, wave a magic wand and say, you don't have to follow the federal guidelines anymore. 
But unfortunately, that that's, again, not the world that, that we're living in and the dollars that we're dealing with are specifically tied to certain things. And so uh, just for clarification, the way that we had to justify uh, receiving the $3.1 million was that that's what our, our public safety expenses are. And under the federal guidelines, what the Department of Treasury said is that all public safety costs budget from March 1st to December 31st are assumed to be COVID related for administrative convenience. And so it's not necessarily that our public safety agencies have seen an increase in cost of $3.1 million. It's that they've seen a total cost of $3.1 million to respond to COVID. And that's how we had to justify it to the governor's office. By no means are we saying that, that it has cost us an additional $3.1 million over and above everything that we ever budgeted. What we're saying is that in this instance, public safety's response is $3.1 million. And of that, uh, we can use those funds to go for, you know, let's say, for example, the mobile radios, as Council Member Cordes brought up, or any of the variety of measures that we've taken as, as a town organization. So please don't misunderstand. I'm sorry if, if that wasn't clear, but that, that is how we were having to justify those expenses to the governor's office so that we could get the maximum amount of funds to the town organization and then disperse some of that to the organization as, as you all see fit. And so we're, what we've done is created a legal framework. Uh, we're happy to, to continue to work on that. If, if you all would like another study session uh, prior to a council action, uh, I know we have uh, the 24th and the 31st would both be Mondays that, that could work for, for future work sessions. If you'd like to come back to this point, we certainly would be willing to, to keep doing some diligent homework and, and working on the ideas with you. And I know uh, we can work with some of those legal issues with Cliff as well. So those are, are more, more than willing to, to adapt to your own needs. You know, I appreciate that you put that out there. What I would like to suggest happen is for council to have an opportunity to review what was provided in regards to the presentation this evening as well as the information from the other communities. Send forward suggestions um, and points to yourself and Cliff, Brent and Lisa, and that can be incorporated into a follow-up presentation on the 24th. And for everybody in the community that's also following along, if they would like to submit any feedback. Mayor, could we go ahead and move that meeting to the 31st? Um, ben is out of town for the next uh, week, and that would give our team a little bit more time to work on it. Absolutely, yes. Thank you. I guess I would like to hear more from our our businesses downtown, and well, not just downtown, but you know, the people who uh, are participating in this, because it gets a little confusing with all the grants and and money that's being made available for payroll and and utilities and this and that and the other, what do they really need? Uh, how can we help them? And you know, uh, I don't know if 300,000 is enough or 3 million. So I like to hear from them to, to get an idea of how we can help them. And maybe that's something uh, Roger can, can champion for us. Now, when you, oh, go ahead. Ben. I have no problem getting more people. I know that there are a number of people that just aren't speaking right now. I've been texting with a couple of them, but if you have another work session, I will absolutely get people um, here um, from businesses from not only Main Street, but all over. I will make sure that happens. Now, the one point I just want to make sure I reemphasize, Vice Mayor, is out of that 3.1 million, we need to be cognizant that we have to make sure that we can take care of what we are obligated to take care of under those federal mandates in regards to our responsibilities in response to the COVID and how we have to implement certain measures and how that is funded. So we do need to make sure that we are upkeeping that obligation because that's also what's helping in us not having the numbers that other municipalities have had and in regards to cases. Yeah. Madam Mayor, can I ask one more quick question? This may be a really dumb question. There's um, no such thing as no, a dumb I'm, This might be, and this is directed towards Ben also. So 
we got 3.1 and you've already said that you have justified where that 3.1 is. So why are we not saying to whoever is auditing that 3.1, here are the expenses that we use it on. We use it on this, this daycare, we use it on this overtime, we use it on these masks. And then use the, you've already then said that, that some of that budget would have already been used otherwise that you already have budgeted. So then could we not then use whatever if you'll take from a different pocket and just say what we have ease the restrictions because this isn't actually the cares money, but this is cares money that, you know, actually paid for it. Would that be sidestepping a little bit where legal would not be happy? Does that make enough sense? Yeah. Mayor, council members and Roger, both in terms of accounting with federal dollars, Easiest way to think about it is if you received a dollar, you had ink on your hands, thumbprint, and every time you pass that dollar, the th thumbprint would stay on the dollar. And so those requirements stay with the dollar as it goes throughout to a destination where you're receiving the dollar for dollar payment of the good that's within the guidelines of the federal government. And so um, there are some organizations that, that don't. I guess maybe that have been a little more cavalier in terms of their uh, legal interpretation of how they can spend the funds. We feel very comfortable with the interpretation that these, these funds are federal funds until they are spent in its ultimate destination. And so if we were to use these funds in ways that are not approved under the, the guidance of the U.S. Treasury Department or under the guidance of the state and the state constitution, the state statutes that we have, and we would be subject to potential repayment of those dollars. And if we had, for, for example, given that out into the community, then we would have to pull from, from our savings or from our fund reserves or heaven forbid our, our actual budget to make up for those expenses. And so again, it's, it's just the, the accounting function of dealing with federal dollars while kind of technically they're state dollars because they came from the federal government, they're still federal dollars. Thank you. Council member Larson. Karen kept raising her hand earlier, so I decided to give I was just floor. about to call on her. Go ahead, council member Wells. Yeah, I, I uh, kind of along the same lines as councilwoman Cortez, I would be interested to see what our public safety budget is prior to COVID-19. In other words, how much had we anticipated spending for public safety had COVID-19 not hit us. Uh, and I recognize that all of that expense is what we use to justify the 3.1 million. But for my way of thinking, if that money is already budgeted, that the only expense that we should be using those funds for would be directly COVID-19 related. So in other words, what's the difference between our budgeted public safety amount and what we believe are actual COVID-19 additional expenses? And to me, that would give us a better view of what we might be able to free up to legally under guidelines help our businesses with. I, I agree. I, I'd like to see more of the financials. Um, I feel like we haven't been given that information line item by line item, what the differences are. Um, and I actually think the same way that Roger does as far as legally, if we've, we've expended this money due to COVID and we could justify it with them, then we could use whatever other money. By the way, I understand what you're saying, but I, I feel like we're being way too conservative. If everyone else is using the same justification, to be able to do things like rent and other expenses to be able to help their local and marketing to be able to do their their local um, help their local businesses then i don't see why you know why we're the exception to that rule now i also know just in listening to some of the conversation and going back and reviewing in my head and ben i'm just going to tap into you and ask you to correct me because I'm genuinely just going from memory here. 
when we had the different phases that we had to layer in due to the COVID, we had different employees that were operating on different shifts. So if you have a typical 40 hour employee that say worked at Parks and Rec or worked at Town Hall, and in order to scaffold staffing, you had some that were telecommuting from home while some were working here. And then your ones that were here full time for 40 hours each week, there was a, an adjustment made. Um, can you clarify that a yeah. little bit? Yeah, absolutely, Mayor. And you know, as, as we were facing the initial stages of, of the pandemic, um, I guess we were fortunate as a state to not have the wave right away. So we were able to kind of learn from some of the lessons that were happening in Washington, in New York, and in California. And we particularly worked with, with city managers and, and the International City County Manager Association to learn what those organizations were doing or what they wish they could have done faster. And so we actually implemented a policy pretty early on that um, that was kind of an initial front to protect employees and the public uh, within the town of Florence. And one of those things that, that you mentioned is that we staggered employees so that we would have minimum exposure between groups so that we would have redundancy and ensure that if a certain cohort of, of employees fell ill, that we could still continue our basic town operations uh, despite a certain segment of our of our employees falling ill. So as we did that, we, we tried to ensure that we're remaining equitable because not all jobs are, are eligible for telecommuting. You can't patch a pothole from home. I mean, you, you can't fix a, a sewer treatment plant from home and you certainly can't respond to a fire from home. And so for many types of employees, we, we broke them down into, into certain classes and, and segments of employees that were essential that were um, emergency critical and that were non-essential. And so we broke those down and, and for those that were responding every day, that re regardless of the situation, they had to respond to work as normal, we had to provide an extra amount of leave so that they could recover from, from the, uh, the crisis and the, the difficulty of the day while still remaining equitable because we had other employees that were staying home and because they were deemed non-essential, uh, were not working. And so uh, we did have an increased expense um, initially up front as part of the COVID situation where uh, we had to pay out some extra leave to the essential uh, emergency critical employees like firefighters, police officers, sewer treatment plant operators that had to report day in, day out, uh, despite the, the unknown citizen. Uh, circumstances of the pandemic. And so that is certainly one of the costs that, that we had listed on the sheet of our increased expenses. And it would certainly be a cost that, that we've already borne and uh, would be aware of, of how that's happening into the future. Thank you for that clarification. All right. Are there any other questions or points of clarification on this? topic. We have definitely covered a lot this evening. We still have more to cover and I do want to say thank you Ben for your hard work and efforts in coordinating putting all of the information together for us. In the information that you're going to send out as well if you'd like if different departments had items like Parks and Rec, for example, I know that they have put on a lot of creative programs, some of the um, opportunities for seniors that we have put forth in regards to meals and some of the services above and beyond of what we would traditionally offer. That is also encompassing some of what is coming from this COVID CARES. We, in regards to the technology, had discussed being able to provide that connection to where if they're unable to visit and meet in person, we're finding those ways where we can socially bring people together through technology if our seniors or residents don't have that access. So any information that you can provide to council, it sounds like it would be appreciated. And we will convene back regarding this topic on August 31st. 
and continue moving forward. We want to get this on the ground and running because we have to disseminate the funds prior to December 31st. All right. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. With that, we need a motion to adjourn to executive session, please. Make a motion to adjourn to executive session. Second. We need a, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed, same sign. Motion carries. We are going to pause to ensure everybody is off of the line prior to continuing with executive session. Thank you.